like to invite you to turn your Bibles with me now to Psalm 57. Psalm 57, and I'll invite Bella to come up to read the passage this morning. Psalm 57, verse 1 through 5. Psalm 51, and verse 1 to 5. Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in me, for in you, my soul takes refuge. I'll take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God, who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebulking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I lie amongst ravages beasts. Men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O Lord, our God. Have the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Thank you, Bella, for reading this morning. Let's pray as we... Prepare to study these words this morning. Lord God, we thank you for these words that we have just read. And Lord, we pray that as we study these words now, that you'd speak to us. Open our ears to hear from you. Open our eyes to see you. And give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning we resume our series on the names of God. You might remember some of the names. Do you remember whether some of the names we've looked at so far? There's five of them. Adonai and Yahweh Hayah. Adonai and Yahweh Hayah. Yep. Do you remember what those names mean? God and Most High. Yeah, Adonai means God Almighty. No, sorry, it's master. Oh, man. <laughs> Lord and master, Adonai means. Yahweh Hayah, Hayah means Lord I am. Anyone remember uh, any of the other names? There's also Hashem, which means the name. There's Elohim, which means God. And the fifth one was El Shaddai, which is, that's the one that means God Almighty. And the name this morning, El Elyon, kind of fits along with El Shaddai, doesn't it? El Shaddai, God Almighty. And as we look at El Elyon this morning, we see that El Elyon means God Most High. Makes sense, right? If he's Almighty, he must be the, the Most High too then, right? Makes sense. Who is the highest position in our land right now? What position is that? By our land, I, I mean our country. Who's, what's the highest position in our country right now? <laughs> Trudeau, about what position does he hold? President? President? That, that actually is the States, but in Canada it's Prime Minister, right? But it's same idea, right? In the States they have the President called, what's his name? Trump, right? So the highest rank in the land is the leader of the country, whether it be a Prime Minister or a President. Um, other countries use other terms like czar. Russia used, used to use a term which is czar. Others use monarchy, so it could be king or queen. Uh, England's funny that way, don't they? They have a prime minister and a queen. So they kind of have a funny head of state. Who's, I don't know, I'm not sure who's actually the head of state. Is it the queen? Or is it the prime minister? I'm not sure. I don't know British politics. so. The, <laughs> um, but anyway, those are high positions, right? If we look in the Old Testament, there's a lot of stories of kings. They're the highest, they're the most high in, in those countries, right? The most high of all is God. And that's why he has the name El Elyon. This term, this name El Elyon is actually used 53 times throughout the Old Testament. So we see that's a pretty important name, isn't it? Because it's used so many times. 
22 of those times, though, is in the book of Psalms. And the passage we're looking at this morning, the name is used there once as well. Lord Most High. It is a name that emphasizes God's supremacy over the entire earth. It also fits with the psalmist's. But the psalmist's emphasis that God's glory is to be praised throughout the entire earth. So it speaks of how awesome God is and how he is worthy of all praise. This morning as we look at this word, this this name, we're going to see that we need to understand that God is the most high. It's interesting Keith had mentioned about learning about God's holiness. That's that's part of being able to understand how God is most high, right? Understanding that he is a holy God. This morning we're going to look at four particular things in this passage that shows us that God is the Most High. So let us pray again and invite the Lord to speak to us in these words. Lord God, as we look at these four points, Lord, may we again fall in love with you. May we again become reacquainted with you and to draw closer to you. Amen. So as I mentioned, there's four things we learn in this passage about El Elyon. And the first is this. God fulfills his purpose for us. God fulfills his purpose for us. We already know that God is almighty because of being able to create all things out of nothing. He spoke the world into being, the stars. He breathed his life into us. But God also shows that he's most high for other reasons other than that. And this first reason this morning again is he, fills, he fulfills his purpose for us. Listen to the words of verse 2 again. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. The psalmist writes here in verse 2, he says he cries out to God the most high. This is where we actually see the word El El Yon. We have the English translation here being God most high. So right away here, the psalmist is writing about God the Most High. He is crying out to him. The psalmist is in a place of he's he's concerned, he's worried, he's maybe even fearful. So he's crying out to God. Oftentimes, I don't know about the rest of you, but oftentimes when I feel in those those places of stress, of tribulation, of trials, of, of stress, it is times where I cry out to God. Just like the psalmist here, we cry out to God. But the psalmist is making note here that he is God most high. Not just that he is God, but God most high. God is supremacy over everything. So why does he cry out to the most high? He says this in the second part of verse 2. To God who fulfills his purpose for me. Have you ever heard that phrase that God has a wonderful plan and purpose for your life? It's true. Sometimes it's misused though when we share the gospel. We need to share the whole truth. But there's a truth to this still that God has a purpose for each one of us. The purpose, first of all, is to be saved. But the second purpose is to use us for his honor and his glory. God wants to use us. He has designed us for purpose. Did you know that design is what brings purpose to anything? Think about the chairs you're sitting on. They're designed for you to sit in, right? So it has a purpose. It has a function. How about this piano over here? The person who made this piano designed it the way they did, and so it has a purpose to make music. Yes, there's different buttons that can help make different sounds, but the purpose of it is to make music. What about your vehicle? It's pretty intricate, isn't it? Nowadays, there's computers in our cars that help maybe tell us, that has a warning light to show us that something's wrong or or runs different components in our vehicle to make sure our vehicle runs smoothly. Very complex, but it's designed, and because there's a design, it has a purpose, it has a function. The same is true with us. God has designed us. God didn't just put things into motion and let things go on. He designed us with purpose. He designed our bodies, but he also designed us 
and he wants to form our character to be like his. God has a purpose for every single one of us. I had a con- conversation with a person online this week, and I asked the person, the church you're attending, are, are you involved right now? And this person said, no, for because of work. And I said, well, how about the days that you're not working? Are you, what kind of ministries are you doing? Not, I'm not talking about programs in the church, but although sometimes some ministries involve programs, but doing ministry, like sharing the gospel or discipling others to grow their faith. It's going to be a challenge because God has a purpose to use that person still. God has a purpose to use each one of us individually and as the church as a whole. God has a purpose for us. And again, this shows how God is most high because he has a purpose for us. He has designed us with purpose in mind. Here's how God fulfills his purpose in us. And I've alluded to these already. First of all is he, his purpose in us by calling us. God fulfills his purpose by calling us into relationship with him. Romans 11 verse 29 says this, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The wonderful thing about this verse is the word calling here. It doesn't mean that God calls certain people, this person or that person, but God calls all people because he has the gift of salvation he has offered to every single one of us. So he calls all of us into relationship with him. The problem sometimes becomes is when we choose not to receive that calling. But that's why God says he has this calling for each one of us to come to relationship with him, to be saved from our sins, and that calling is irrevocable. That means that God desired to give this calling to us and he's never, going to re- he's never going to withdraw that calling to us. It's wonderful to know, isn't it? That's why someone who dies on their deathbed and moments before asks God to forgive their sins and turns their life towards the Lord, even if it's that last second before, God still saves them because his calling is irrevocable. He does not call pull his request back. It's like this. Have you ever been offered a gift and then the person asks you to give it back? It's not really a gift then, is it? That's kind of picture. God does not take his gift back, his gift of salvation. He offers it to us and it's offered to us to either receive it or we pass away. This again shows that God is most high because he has a purpose for us and is calling for us. And the second part of that is God fulfills his purpose in us by equipping us. It's wonderful to know that we don't have to do ministry. We don't have to do God's work on our own strength. He equips us for every good work. Hebrews 13, 21 says this, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This verse tells us that God will equip us. We see that when just before Jesus ascended to heaven and even before he died, he shared some teaching about the Holy Spirit, that God, that Jesus was going to send his spirits to the disciples to equip them for the work that God had for them. And then when he ascended, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Uh, 10 days later. God wasn't going to leave us unequipped. God doesn't say, I want you to go share the gospel with your neighbor, but you know what? You're going to have to figure it all out on your own. I'm not going to give you the boldness to do it. I'm not going to give you the strength to do it. I'm not going to give you the words to do it. You do it on your own. No, God doesn't do that. He equips us. He gives us spiritual gifts. He gives us talents and abilities. He equips us for every good work. That's why God could take someone like me, a lump like me. There's times I say, Lord, how is it that you call me to be a pastor? I know my, my inadequacies. I know my imperfections. God knew those far better than I do, actually. But yet he still chose me for this work. God may not necessarily call you to be a pastor, but God has called you into his ministry to do his work. He has called each one of us to work together in the work of the gospel and discipleship. 
So God fulfills his purpose in us. And again, that shows that he is the most high. There's a second way that God shows that he is the most high, and that is in that he will save us. He will save us. In verse 3, it says this, He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. God shows here again that he is most high because he will save us. Yes, in the context of the psalm, the psalmist is thinking about how God's going to save him from his enemies, from, from those who want to trample him. But we see that God saves far more than just saving us from people who do wrong. We see that God is the most high because he saves us from our sins. And he's willing to intervene. Isn't that an amazing thing? Again, how could the God the Most High, how could he see fit to save anyone from their situation? Knowing that he would create us and knowing that we would sin, knowing that we'd fail and fall short, and yet still he is willing to save us. And if we turn to him, he does save us. He intervenes. It shows that he is the most high. When I was younger, I was thought it'd be great to do a job as a lifeguard. So I started taking courses and training for that. And unfortunately, I didn't get that far. But as I started doing some of the training and seeing what the lifeguards go through for training, I had a new appreciation for lifeguards. How they actually put themselves in danger to save someone else. Have you ever been at a pool or at the lake when you've seen someone struggling? And you see the lifeguard jump into action and they dive into the, or they don't actually dive. They have a certain way they jump in so they don't, so they can still have sight of, of the person who's, who's drowning. And then they swim out. Now the thing about when a person, when they're drowning is that they usually get an adrenaline rush. And, they, and doctors have said that when someone has an adrenaline rush, their strength increases probably about even up to 10 times amount. The stories of little babies who, because they're adrenaline rushing, their mother went to pick them up and the baby grabs onto the mother's hand and actually crushes the mother's hand. Pretty incredible, hey? And that's what the lifeguard's going into. But the lifeguard is going out to save that person and will, willingly does it to intervene to save that person's life. There's a small picture of God. God was willing to save us despite our sin, despite our own rebellion. Here's how he saves us. He saves us by his sacrifice. Ephesians 5 verse 2 says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I know we all know this as we've, we go through this this morning, but it's a good reminder that God saves us by his sacrifice on the cross. He also saves us by his resurrection. We know the story of Jesus on the cross, right? But that's not the whole of the gospel. Part of it, too, is, is that he rose three days later. Yes, he died for our sins, but being raised from the dead, it gives, us, gives him his power, to forgive our sins, to wash our sins away. Romans 5, verse 24 to, 20, 24 to 25 says, It will be accounted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our transgressions and raised up for our justification. There it is there. God saves us also by his resurrection because his resurrection brings about justification. That thing that God does, it's nothing that we can do. God, we don't justify ourselves, but God does when we come to faith in him. He puts us a stamp of approval on us and says, you are saved, I've forgiven your sins, and I've made you pure as the snow again. Also, God saves us by his gift of eternal life. Makes sense, doesn't it? Since he died for our sins, since he was raised in power to offer us his gift of salvation, 
then he offers us this gift of eternal life. Romans 6, 23, again, the familiar words. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God saves us. And again, it shows how he is the most high. That's the most wonderful act of, sal- of, of saving is his gift of salvation. But I wonder how many times that we maybe don't even realize that God has even saved our lives from death in order to continue to use us or, or to come to salvation maybe. I'm sure we could all maybe tell some stories that we're aware of. I remember I shared one several weeks ago of how I almost skied over a, a cliff and how God protected me and God used my friends to keep me safe and pull me back up from, from the cliff. God can and does save, especially when it comes to saving us from our sins. So he fulfills his purpose for us, and he saves us. There's a third thing we see in our passage this morning that speaks to how God is the Lord Most High. And that is, he will send out his love. The second part of verse 3 again says this, God will send out his steadfast love. I like that. He will send out his steadfast love. Do you know what the term steadfast means? It means perseverance. It means it doesn't end. It continues on and on and on. God sends out his love to us continuously. God has shown his love to us in many ways to get to salvation for one, but he shows love in other ways too in how he provides for us. Maybe it's through a job or maybe it's another way that God has given funds to pay our bills, to pay for our food and our shelter. God shows that he loves us. Maybe it's by the encouraging words of another person or maybe it's because someone our broke, vehicle broke down on the road and someone stops to help us. God continuously shows his love towards us in so many ways, ways we realize and don't realize. He sends out his love to us. Here's mainly how he sends out his love to us. First of all, he sends his love by creating us. There's a phrase that says God doesn't create, God creates no junk. He creates each one of us with intention. Because when he thought of us, he thought, I love that person. And he knew whether we were going to receive his gift of salvation or not, but he still loved us by creating us and giving us the opportunity to come to faith in him. He created us. The words are from Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, God says to Jeremiah, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Well, God may not necessarily send us to as a prophet to the nations, but God has a plan and purpose that we have talked about earlier. But he, again, he sent out his love by thinking of, before he even created us, he thought of us. And when he thought of us, he loved us. Next, God sends his love by saving us. It always comes back to this, doesn't it? That God saves us it is an act of love. Romans 5, verse 9 through 10 again says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by this life. Now, it doesn't use the term that God loves us here, but we see that this is all speaking of an act of love. As Jesus says elsewhere, no greater love has any man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Jesus did that for us. He laid his life down for each man, woman, and child. He has shown great love to us. So we see that God is the most high because he fulfills his purpose for us. He saves us and he sends out his love. And there's one final way we see that God is the most high and that is he will send out his faithfulness. 
In verse 3, again, it says this. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. I love that. Not only does he send out his love, but he sends out his faithfulness. Yes, he sends it out because he loves us, but it shows that God is always faithful. The Hebrew word here for faithfulness is emit, which means reliability or sureness. I remember the days when I was younger when my dad used to talk about how they don't make vehicles like they used to. They used to be built tough. They would last a long time. I remember we actually had a, I can't remember, it was a Nova. I can't remember what brand of car that was. It was this Nova car, and it actually flipped over the numbers on the mileage. That's a lot of mileage, isn't it? That's, I think that's, I think that's a million kilometers. Isn't that right? Because there's six numbers, right? And it flipped over. It's amazing to see that. We don't see that in vehicles anymore, right? <laughs> I remember a conversation with someone who, actually, my, I think my wife had this conversation. Someone had said that, oh, well, as you're looking for a vehicle, you should get a, a Chrysler or a Dodge because they're really good up to 100,000. They can get 100,000 K. And our response was, well, GM does 500,000 K, so why would we? Anyway, the point is um, reliability. God is reliable, far more than any vehicle, right? God is so reliable. He's faithful in everything he does and says. Everything he does is for our best. God is faithful because he fulfills his promises. Every single promise he makes, he fulfills. You know the, t- the phrase that they say, you can take that to the bank? Well, you can take that to the bank. God is faithful. He fulfills all his promises. Now, sometimes his promises may, be, may not be fulfilled in our idea of the time frame, but God will still fulfill his promises to us. Second Peter 3 verse 9 says, speaking along those lines, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Again, it speaks back to that calling we talked about earlier, right? God is faithful. He is patient with us. He gives us every single opportunity possible to come to faith in him. All those other promises too. This verse relates to that still too. God will fulfill every promise. Again, not in our time frame, but in his time frame. Because he knows what is best. Also, God is faithful because he keeps his word. Sounds like the same thing as keeping his promise, doesn't it? But there's times in God's word we do see that it's not a promise, but he says something and he does it still. He keeps his word always. 1 Peter 1 verse 23 to 25 says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that that was preached to you. Again, those lines in verse 25, but the word of the Lord remains forever. His word is true. When God speaks his word through the Bible, or when he speaks to us directly, his word is true. He will always keep his word. We can take that to the bank. God is faithful, far more than we all are. God will fulfill his promises for us. When he says, I care for you, I will make sure you're cared for, he, makes, he does take care of that. We can always trust him. Again, sometimes when we talked about earlier during our testify time, sometimes we feel like God is distant. We don't feel his presence. We're in that time of valley. But God is still faithful in that time. Remember the old Footprints poem? I'm not going to recite it for you, but the gist of it is, at the end of a man's life, he looks back and they use the allegory of walking along the beach. 
And this man sees two set of footprints. And many times there's one set of footprints. And he says to God, I notice that when there's one set of footprints, that's always the toughest time. Why did you leave me in those times? And God said it in those times is when I carried you. God is faithful to keep his word. Even when we feel like he's not there, he is there carrying us through, for fulfilling his very word and promises to us there. Remember his promises before he ascended to heaven? He said, neither will I leave you nor will I forsake you. He is with us always. God is faithful. We see in the psalm this morning, Psalm 57, that God is the Most High. And it's significant for us to remember the names, especially when we're in hard times, when we're in trials, or someone's pursuing to do harm to us. We can remember that God is the Most High. God is greater than them. We can trust Him. We can trust Him because He fulfills His purpose in us. He saves us from our sins. He also sends out his love to us. And he sends out his faithfulness to us. There's a picture in Revelation of God sitting on his throne. There's been times where I've sat and thought and imagined, what could that look like? And I picture a grand white throne that's raised above everyone else and God sitting there, showing that he's supreme above all things. And to imagine being there before God when he calls us to heaven, to be able to stand before his throne without fear of anything anymore, but to feel absolute peace, to know God most high is here before me. God may be sitting on his throne, and the day is coming when we'll stand before his throne, but we know that God is the most high. He is El Elyon. I want to encourage us to two points of action this morning. First is, come to Jesus. If you have not repented, repented of your sins yet, come to Jesus. Repent of your sins. Ask him to forgive your sins. And he will forgive you. But also to surrender your life to him. For us as Christians too, we need to come to Jesus still. It doesn't mean that we need salvation again. We don't need to be saved again. Once we're saved, we're saved. But we do need to continuously come to Jesus to continue to surrender ourselves to him continuously. Or when we have troubles or hardships, Come to Jesus because he cares for you. The next point of action, too, is to bow before him. To sometimes physically do that because it reminds us to put us in our place of where we need to be in a place of humility before God. But to bow before him also in our worship. When we sing praises to God, maybe about no one else other than God. When we sing a hymn or a chorus, when we pray, when we fellowship, all these things, may we bow before God in all that we do. There's a warning for us this morning, though. If you do not heed these words, you will be looking to the wrong person for the highest position, and you will be end up worshiping a false god. We see this happen with a lot of false religions out there. We even see that sometimes in the Christian church where sometimes people have a wrong idea of God and they end up worshiping a God of their own image instead of the one true God. So make sure you seek to know the one true God, El Elyon, the God Most High. But if you do heed these words, there's a blessing. The blessing is this, that you'll recognize that God is the Most High God. You'll recognize the one true God, and you'll come to a place of reverence and thankfulness to him. Again, even when we face those trials and tribulations, we can still come to him and say, I know that you are the one true God. You are God most high, and I give thankfulness for all that you have given me and all the ways you have shown your love to me. Do you want to know the one true God? Then seek to know El Elyon, God most high. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you are an awesome and mighty God, that you are the Most High, your El Elyon. Lord God, there's many names we have seen and many more names we'll see of who you are in your character. 
and all speak of how great you are. It all again spoke, speaks to how you are the most high, almighty. You are the I am. You are Lord and master. You are God. Lord God, we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us both personally and through your word. Lord, we ha- may we have that awesome awe and respect for you that we are your children and you are our friend too. That you walk with us. Lord, may we walk in tune with you. As your word says, may we keep in the spirit, keep in step with the spirit. Lord, may we keep in step with you to draw close to you, to know you more, to love you more. God, you're a wonderful God. We praise you. Amen.